Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 7, and we're uh, still in the Sermon on the Mount. We're getting close to it. Uh, Jesus is getting close to finishing this up. Again, for context, Jesus is talking to Jews that are under the law, and these things apply doctrinally to those Jews. They don't necessarily apply doctrinally to us unless, what's the test? Anybody know what the test is if these things are going to apply directly to a Christian today? you got to find it in, in Romans through Philemon, right? If it, if it don't contradict that, then, then we can apply it to ourselves. That's, that's the test we, we're going to take. So, uh, so we're still talking uh, to Jews, about Jews under the law, and about what? The coming what? Kingdom. The coming earthly kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's came uh, offering the Jews the kingdom of heaven. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for him to set up and rule and reign in Jerusalem. That's what we're talking about, the literal physical kingdom. I'm not talking about the kingdom of God right here. And so with that being said, let's jump in here. We're in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start at 16th verse. Uh, let know we're going to back up to 15 because this sets the context of what we're going to be talking about this morning. And so I'm going to start in 15. I'm going to read a bunch. I'm going to read all the way to 23, and then we'll back up and talk about it. And, uh, and so just prior to this, remember, Jesus is talking about enter the narrow, through the narrow way. Let's just jump back there to 13. Look, enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and there are many who are going in by it. What is the broad road to destruction? Oh, there you can see, said it. It's religion. It's church. The broad road to destruction. Y'all come in. Is uh is okay, here y'all? We can sit in the back. Do what? Sing a little song. This is their Do they know you? Well, y'all get it. One second. Chip's gonna sing us a song. Do y'all need one? You got it. Are they singing? Huh? Oh, you're gonna sing. You're gonna sing first. You okay. sing first, then they'll sing. Okay. <laughs> All righty. We're waiting. <laughs> well, if y'all want to introduce yourself, I'm Joel. I'm Ton. Joel Ton. All right. Nice to y'all be here this morning. Uh, we're in Matthew chapter seven. Yeah. California, all right. <laughs> yeah, just to get, yeah. We'll take you. All right. We're in Matthew chapter 7. That's where we are. And, uh, and, and so remember, we talked last week about the, ne the, the broad road to destruction is religion. It's not, uh, you know, uh, Living a sinful lifestyle and all of that stuff. That comes, uh, the devil's got all that worked out. The broad road to destruction is religion. The devil works in religion. You know, people think, well, the devil's working. You know, you got these devil worshipers and, you know, homosexuals and this, that, and other. Let me tell you what. The devil works in the church. He works in religion. He works through religion. And he'll twist the scripture. And that's how he gets people confused. And how does he twist scripture? He uses false prophets and false teachers. That's the context what the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about right here. False prophets and false teachers. And so he gives us the context of this passage of scripture uh, talking about enter by the narrow gate, uh, not by the broad road. And so here we go, verse 15. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. 21. Now, not everyone 
who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now I want to stop right there and I want to make a confession. I don't know how many times I've preached this passage of scripture, but it's been many. It has been many, many times that I've preached this passage of scripture, and every single time I've preached it out of context. And in fact, every pastor that I've ever heard preach this passage of scripture has preached it out of context. And, and so that's why it's so important. We need to understand who's talking and who's he talking to and what age are they in. And so we know this is a sermon on the mount and the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to Jews. He's not talking to the church, not a Christian one on the whole deal. He hadn't hung on the cross yet. He's talking to these Jews and they are, uh, they are looking to enter a literal physical kingdom on earth where Jesus rules and reigns on the throne in Jerusalem. And so that's the context of it. The whole passage. And so I'm going to tell you how I preach this verse. Or this passage of scripture. Especially the Lord, Lord. Not everybody calls me Lord, Lord. I always preach that as this is Christian. This is people that go to church and think they're Christians. And they act like Christians. And they do Christian things. But they're not really Christians. That's the way I preach that. Now, that's a spiritual application that you can take out of that text right there. And I'm not saying that's a wrong message to preach, but that is not what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying right there. First of all, he's talking to false prophets, false Jewish prophets in this passage. And we'll get to that here in a minute. And so, number one on your sheet there is, who is Jesus talking about in these verses? Somebody read Matthew 24, 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Well, there you go. We saw that right there. At first 15 says, beware of false prophets. And, uh, and, he, and he says something <laughs> interesting. He said, they come to you in sheep's clothing. Okay? And so, so we know that's a disguise, right? They are disguising themselves. They are false prophets disguising themselves as shepherds, as prophets from God. And, uh, and number two says, what are the fruits of false teachers and false prophets? Now, remember last week we learned that in the Old Testament you had false prophets. In the New Testament we have false teachers. And, and, and they're, they're very similar in how they operate. In fact, they're ex exactly identical in how they operate. But it says in there, you will know them by their fruits. And so what are the fruits of a false prophet or a false teacher? Somebody read 2 Peter 2, 1. But there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, brought, who bought them and bringing on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth well, there you go. So we, well, I just mentioned that before. See, there's a distinction. Look at that first part of that verse. There's a distinction between uh, there were false prophets among the people back then. It says, even as there will be false teachers among you. So we're talking about two different things right here. We're talking about Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. It's talking about false prophets uh, in his time in the Old Testament. And we can also apply this same thing to false teachers here. We see this. Peter does this. But look at what's the fruit there. Destructive heresies, right? That's the fruit they have. It is they, let me tell you how the devil works. And, it, and, and these, are, these are his ministers. These false teachers, false prophets are ministers of Satan. The devil works through being subtle. If you see that in Scripture, again, look, look, at, look in, at Genesis 3. Subtle. He's subtle. So he's not, he's not out there in your face. So if, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're a Christian, you're not going to be uh, deceived if Satan comes out there, uh, you know, uh, 
like a red dragon with a pitchfork. I mean, you're not going to be <laughs> deceived with that, right? He's subtle. And so what the Satan does is he takes truth and he adds a little error. Just enough error that you can't, you don't know that it's there. Y'all heard me talk about the Catholic Church. 98% of that thing is orthodox. But it's got a deadly 2% in there that'll put you in hell. We've heard, heard me say it's like a, 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 a glass of sweet tea with a drop of arsenic in it. It tastes good. It smells good. It looks good. It, it feels good going down, but it'll kill you. Work salvation will kill you. And that's that particular heresy I'm talking about. So, so everything's good. Like the, we talked about uh, uh, going out there to the Mormon temple. Uh, when we went out there and we planted that church in Utah and uh, in, the, in the whole complex around that temple. And you walk in that building and, and they've got these big murals of Jesus and the disciples and I mean all the way through the Old Testament in the garden. I mean beautiful pictures painted on the walls. I mean them walls as tall as it. And you got the whole <coughs> Bible laid out in picture form through this whole huge building. It all looks good. It's a different Jesus. That Jesus on that walls and that Mormon temple is created. He ain't God. He's just, he's just another part of the creation. See, it's, it's a lot of truth with, 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 a, with a variation. And that's why he says, hey, uh, uh, they come in sheep's clothing. They look good. They got a lot of truth. But then they'll mix a little error in there. So that is their fruit. And you know what? You're not going to know that they have heresies unless you do what? you got to study that book. <laughs> if you don't study that book, you're not going to know. Because I want to guarantee you something, folks. There are false teachers and false uh, preachers and pastors out there in churches and denominations that look a whole lot more Christian than you do and me. And they do a whole lot more good out there for the world than you and me do. And they're deadly. They're dead. You cannot go by somebody's works. You go by what's their doctrine. What's their theology. Because these folks are slick. And they are in, they're in sheep's clothing. I've got some people down here. Muhammad. Uh, you take Muhammad. You take them Muslims over there. And they'll believe. The, they'll say they believe the Old Testament. You know, uh, they change it up. They say that Abraham offered Ishmael instead of Isaac on the altar and all that. But see, they'll twist it then. They'll twist it. They'll take some truth, they'll add error to it, and come up with uh, this false uh, religion. Joseph Smith, we mentioned him of the Mormons. You know, this guy, he, uh, uh, he, he, he got visited by an angel. And the angel gave him all that Book of Mormon. Well, Remember what Paul says in Galatians about an angel? When an angel brings you any other doctrine other than what I teach, what he say? Let him be what? Anathema, cursed, damned. That's what Paul says. Even if an angel of light comes and gives you a different gospel <coughs> than what we're giving you right here, let him be cursed. That's exactly what happened to Muhammad. Muhammad said Gabriel came to him and gave him Islam. That's an angel. Give him a different gospel. Joseph Smith, he had, I don't remember what the name of his angel was, Moriah or something like that. Yeah. Uh, this angel comes to Joseph Smith and gives him a different gospel. And Paul says right there, I, I remember, I'll never forget what's out there. And you know, when you go in that Mormon complex, they have these uh, missionaries. They're teenage kids. And, 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 you know, they send them out all over the world, but, man, they're all over this place, too, and they're in pairs, and they come, and they see you as a visitor, and they lead you around and all that. And I asked that girl, I told that girl, we, I said, should they carry around a King James Bible with the Book of Mormon attached to it? And I said, is that a King James Bible you're holding there? And she said, yeah, and I said, turn to Galatians 1.8. And she read, I said, read that for me. And it, and it's, you know, talks about if an angel brings you another gospel. I said, and we were standing in the front of the statue of Joseph Smith. And I wasn't being ugly to her. I said, I said, isn't that just what you said that Joseph Smith did? And she said, well, you know, I haven't seen that. I said, well, just go study it. I, saw, I just didn't press her on it right there. 
Uh, we got some more there. Uh, Ellen G. White. Anybody know who she is? Who she start? Seventh Day Adventist. Uh, she was a woman that, that that prophesied and prophesied, and she come up with uh, uh, Seventh Day Adventist, and they still re <coughs> revere her and her prophecy. Anybody know who Charles Russell is? Jehovah's Witness. They started the Watchtower Society. Again, they don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ is God. They think he's a created being. And so, so they'll use the Bible and then they'll change it. And they'll add something to it. But it's subtle, okay? It sounds good. It sounds good, but it's, that's the way these false teachers <clears throat> and false prophets. And then that's the broad road to destruction because there are millions and millions and millions of people that are following this religious road to hell. And they think they're right. Narrow, narrow, <clears throat> narrow is the gate. And we and we know what that gate is, right? It's the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That's the only way. All right, number three. So he says something right here. He says, uh, Not in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? The literal, physical kingdom on this earth. It's not heaven, y'all. It's not heaven. It's physical, literal kingdom. Jesus ruling and reigning on the throne of Jerusalem. That's the kingdom of heaven. He says, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So we've got this kingdom that Jesus is here offering these Jews. He's going to set up this kingdom, this literal kingdom. He's going to fulfill all the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's going to fill the promises to David. He'll wipe Rome out. He'll set up his throne in Jerusalem, rule and reign. This is the kingdom he's offering. And how do you get in that kingdom? He says, he who does the will of my father. So what's the will of the father to get into the kingdom of heaven? Somebody read John 6, 28. They said to him, What shall we do that we may work for the, the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So, so listen, it's the same way you get into the kingdom of heaven that we get into the kingdom of God. you got to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And so who, do, who are the Jews looking for? They're not looking for someone to take their sin away. They're looking for someone to save their nation. So I, I, my internet was down. Flip to Isaiah chapter 9. Waiting for They're waiting on Messiah. That's right. Isaiah chapter 9. And see, we, we, Messiah, Christ is the word for Messiah. And if you don't know what Messiah is, you know, we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ all the time. Most Christians have no idea what Christ means or what Messiah means. It's the Savior of Israel, not the Savior of your soul. Now, he'll be the Savior of your soul, but Messiah is the Savior of Israel. Look at Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, we're going to start 6 right here. This is a familiar verse. This is a very verse that we read at Christmas all the time, but people don't get the context of this verse because they don't read it all the way to the end. And so let's read this. I'm going to read it. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Okay, listen to this. I'll say, the child is born, that's the human being, the Lord Jesus Christ, that was born of a Virgin Mary, uh, that was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was a human being, 100% human, born. Son, uh, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. This is the Son of God. This is the eternal deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is both human and God. Because God said, today I have begotten you. So the Lord Jesus Christ is in existence from eternity. He didn't just start whenever he was born. By he is with God in eternity. And one day, God says, today I have begotten you. Made him a son. A son that's given. And listen to this. And the government will be upon his shoulder. Is the government on the, the Lord Jesus Christ's shoulder right now? <laughs> Why no. Every government in this world is as wicked and crooked as the day is long, including our own. Lord Jesus Christ not run a government. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of his increase, of his government, and peace there shall be no end. Is there any peace at all on the world today? Is his government growing today? He ain't even, he ain't even involved in government right now. Now there's a, there's a big segment, section of, of Christendom that believes that the world is just going to keep getting better and better and better. You, you, you got these uh, 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 new apostolic reformation folks. That's what they believe is Seven Hills Dominion Theology. The Christians are going to take over the, the news media. Is that a joke? <laughs> the Christians are going to take over entertainment. They're going to take over government. They're going to take over all these uh, institutions and then it will usher in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's not what's going on here. And listen to this. There will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. See, that's what, that's what they, don't, they don't read. It's talking about Israel in order to establish, in order it and establish it with justice and justice from that time forward, forever, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So they're looking for Messiah, the Savior of Israel. You remember what the, what, what the disciples, you know, they had been walking with Jesus for three years. He had hung on the cross. He had re been resurrected. He had walked with them for 40 days explaining the scriptures to him. Remember, open the scriptures up to him. And at the very end of that, before he gets ready to go, do you all remember the question that they asked him? Will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? These folks had walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for three years, and they had spent 40 days explaining, he had spent 40 days explaining to them, and they didn't get all of this church age stuff that we live in today. They were looking for him to be Messiah to restore the kingdom to Israel. And what did he say? He didn't say, no, you're wrong, you missed it. He said, it's not for you to know the days and the seasons. He's got to do that. We've talked about that. He's got to fulfill those promises. But he said, time out. We got a 2,000 year time out for the Jew until the fullness of the Gentiles come and we're living in this church age, the age of grace. But they're looking for Messiah. And how do you get into that kingdom? You got to know that that Jesus that is standing on the bank of the Sea of Galilee preaching the Sermon on the Mount is Messiah. And a lot of them believed he was. Y'all remember when he entered in Jerusalem? The crowds were yelling, Hosanna in the highest. Make a way for the Lord, the, the son of David. See, that's Messiah. That, that Jesus is, is coming into Jerusalem on that donkey, and they know full well he is fixing to kick Rome out and set up the kingdom. Didn't happen, did it? No, they changed their mind, and they crucified him. Praise God, they did. Is that crazy for me to say? Without the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you ain't getting in heaven. We need, to, we need to feel sorry for those Jews that rejected him, but praise God they did because it opened the door for the rest of us. Not just for him to be Messiah, the Savior of Israel, but for him to be Savior of all mankind for those who put their faith and trust in his blood shed on the cross. God had a plan. So that's the will of the Father for the Jew. To believe that Jesus Christ that showed up, you know, John went in front of him, John the Baptist, preparing the way of the Lord, repent for, for the kingdom of heaven is hand. And so if those folks that had put their faith and trust in Jesus, as he's going around doing those miracles around the Sea of Galilee, and they believe he is our Messiah, and if those chief priests in the Sanhedrin would have accepted him, Man, it had all taken place right there. They would have gone right into that kingdom. But remember what the scripture said? The Pharisees did. They shut the doors to the kingdom, right? Remember that? We talked about that. Can anybody shut the door to the kingdom on you today, the kingdom of God? I think nobody shut the door on the kingdom of God. All you got to do is put your faith and trust. But see, the Sanhedrin were the only ones that could make him king. And whenever they rejected him, had him crucified, shut the door on them getting into this literal physical kingdom. But the way you get in there was they were to believe in him, Messiah. What number four says, what is the will of the Father for those living in the church age today? 
After the resurrection, what's the will of the Father? We're not trying to get into the kingdom of heaven. That's for the tribulation. That's after we're raptured out, God will take care of all of that. But we're trying to get into the kingdom of God. And how do we do that? What's the will of the Father for those that want to get into the kingdom of God today? Somebody read John 6, 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. you got to believe. That's how you get into the kingdom of God. You believe that the Lord Jesus Christ hung on a cross as your substitute. And he paid the penalty for your <laughs> sin. And he gave you his righteousness and you put your sin on him. That was a legal transaction. That's how you got to believe. You gotta believe. So the will of the Father is the same both for them getting in the kingdom of heaven. You gotta believe Jesus is the Messiah. And for us, if you want to spend eternity in heaven, have your sins forgiven, you gotta believe Jesus is the Savior of your soul, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. All right, he says in this passage, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, who he does the will of the Father. And many will say to me, In that day, so we need to figure out what day is the Lord Jesus Christ talking about right here. What day is Jesus talking about to these Jews? Somebody read Isaiah, Isaiah 4, 1. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. In that day branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and healing for those of Israel who have escaped. Those of Israel who have escaped what? Anybody? Tribulation. The, tribul the Antichrist. So what we got going on here folks is remember the king of heaven is taken off the table for the Jews whenever they reject him as Messiah. They hung him on the cross. And we know that uh, uh, that is taken off the table. It's going to come back on the table after the church is raptured out. And God turns his attention back to Israel because he's got to fulfill those promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David because they're everlasting. They're unconditional. The only way he fulfills those promises, they've got to have that land. All the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant is all about land. It's all about land over there in the land of Palestine where no Palestinian has any right to any one foot of ground over there. It was all given, title deed given to Abraham, and in the boundaries of it, we talked about that the other day, they extend all the way from Egypt all the way over there to Iraq. That's what the Jews own, and one day they'll have it, and Jesus will rule and reign. And so the day they're talking about right here is whenever the Lord Jesus Christ returns to save the remnant of Israel that's left that the Antichrist hadn't wiped out. Now, that dude's going to kill two-thirds of the Jews, man. It's going to make the Holocaust and Hitler's day look like a walk in the park. You have no idea how terrible uh, living on this planet is going to be during that time. Praise God we won't be there to see it. Amen. But it's going to be awful for those Jews, and that's the day. That's the day he's talking about. When is God going to come and send the Lord Jesus Christ to restore Israel? And it says, the fruit of the earth shall be excellent. Because, you know, God's going to re revamp the earth. Not the new heaven and the new earth yet. No, we've got a thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ when this earth is going to be like it was in the garden. Is that going to be wild? The animal kingdom's different. <coughs> the atmosphere's different. The plant growth is different. R remember, Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. It's going to be incredible fruitful we're going to work we're going to have jobs we're not going to have thorns and thistles and all those things it's going to be great what our role is in that i don't know we'll have glorified bodies but uh, uh these jews and the gentiles that come out of the tribulation we're going to rebuild this earth and i'm sure we're going to help them do it all right five what day is g okay uh romans 11 i didn't i couldn't my internet was gonna flip over romans 11 we're going to talk about this a little more this is the day that these Jews are looking for. Romans 11, 25. 
This is Paul. Remember in Romans, Romans is arguably the most important book in the Bible because, I mean, as far as Christians are concerned. And remember in Romans, we, we've got the vast majority of Christians believe that, that, that the church replaced Israel. We've talked about that before. That's the heresy of replacement theology. That God's done with Israel, the church replaced them. And Paul tells us in Romans, uh, you're reading through Romans there, and it's all about church age. It's all about the age of grace. And he gets to Romans 9, and, and, and it's like Paul says, time out. He knew, the Holy Spirit knew, that the Christians were going to reject the Jews, and were going to persecute them for 2,000 years. And they're not going to have any excuse to do it because Paul in Romans in chapter 9 says, time out, let me tell you about these Jews God's not done with them. Now anybody could read Romans 9 through 11 and think the church replaced Israel is beyond me unless they just got blind or something. But let's look at what it says right here in Romans 11, 25. For I desire, brethren, that you should be... That, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. I want you to, I want that to sober you up. Do you see what we just read? That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now, there better not be a day goes by, and I, 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 I can't say that I do this every day, but more days than not that I don't pray for the Jews. You need to be praying for the Jews, that God would have mercy on them, and he would open their eyes, and they would receive him as Savior. Because a Jew saved today is saved just like me and you, and they're going to end up in the church in the body of Christ. And we see, we're seeing a bigger revival in Israel since the time of Christ right now. It's unbelievable what's going on over there. You know, even 10 or 12 years ago, there was less than a, a 1,500 believing Jews in Israel. And there's thousands now. They've got on that internet, and they've got on uh, YouTube and social media, and they're presenting the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrew. And these young Hebrews... These young Jews are accepting Jesus right and left and having to hide from their parents. No, it's incredible, man. What's going on. And that's all prophesied. That tells you even we're closer and closer to the end. But it says 26. And so all Israel will be saved. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, you might say, how will all Israel be saved? Because two-thirds of them are wiped out by the Antichrist, and the following third accepts Jesus as their Messiah. It says they're going to look on the one whom they have pierced and mourn. And so all these Jews that have hated Jesus Christ for, for two millennia, and they hate him today, but you better love the Jew. It says they're enemy on the gospel's account, but they're beloved on account of the Father. And so regardless of they, they, what they say about Jesus, you love them, you pray for them. But that one-third that's left is going to accept Jesus, and they're all going to get saved. He gonna, he's going to rescue them out of the hand of the Antichrist. And so that is the day these Jews are going to be looking for that Jesus is talking to right here. But what day are we looking for? What day are church-age Christians looking for? Somebody read 2 Thessalonians 2, 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or by spirit or by the word or by the letter as if from the us, as though the days of Christ had come. The day of Christ had come. Now listen, I don't, I don't get in a big fight with folks about the timing of the rapture, as long as you believe there is one. Uh, I, I'm talking about from a premillennial perspective. Now I got big problems if you're all millennial. I think you got to reject just about all this Bible, and you need to understand them. The vast majority of Christians today believe uh, don't believe in the literal thousand year reign of Lord Jesus Christ. They'll look at Revelation as apocryphal uh, literature. It's all symbolic. Uh, they'll make God out to be a liar. 
whenever God says, Abraham, you're going to have this land. Anybody that believes that the church replaced Israel makes God out to be a liar. Because that's an everlasting promise. Will God have to lie? If, if, if the Jew's not going to have that land, God's a liar. Well, God ain't a liar. <laughs> and and it's, it is literal. And the, and, but you know what? I'm not looking to run and dodge the Antichrist and have Jesus save me at the last minute. The Jew's looking for that. I'm not. I'm looking for his coming. And I'm looking for him to take me away. I hope that's what you're looking for. It says what? Gathering together to him. Somebody read First Thessalonians 4. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now if you believe that, most people are going to think you're crazy. That you believe in fairy tales. By golly, I'm going to meet the Lord in the air. I'm going to meet the Lord in the air. I believe that with all my heart. And, uh, and that's the day I'm looking for. Now look, uh, whether you believe that the Lord is going to rapture the church out before the seven years, or whether you believe that the Lord is going to rapture the church out at the, at the midway of the tribulation or some point in time during the I'm not going to argue with that. I know that hard times are coming for the church before the Antichrist comes anyway, and it's going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible in this country, and you're not ready for it, and I'm not ready for it, and your children aren't ready for it. But... Uh, but as far as uh, us facing the wrath of God and the tribulation, we ain't going to face wrath. It says we're not appointed unto wrath. So we know at one, some point in time during the tribulation, it's, it's going to switch from the Antichrist bringing tribulation on the world to the God bringing tribulation on the world. We're not going to be there for that. We're not going to be there for that. Those Jews will have to live through it, and those people that... Ha that uh, uh, have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ before he uh, raptures his church, they're going to have to live through it. They're going to have to persevere to the end. God's going to allow the Antichrist to do his part, but God is still doing it. That's right. And he uses that devil. You know what the Bible says? God uses that devil as a rod. A rod of discipline. And so the devil does God's work for him all the time. Just like wicked men do God's work for him all the time. Nebuchadnezzar. He was a wicked pagan king, and the word of God says he was God's servant. He wiped out nation after nation after nation, millions of people. And boy, they wiped them out harsh. Boy, they rip open them pregnant women and all of that kind of stuff. But the Bible says he was a servant of the Lord. And so uh, God uses both the good and the bad. And so that's the day we're looking for. I hope that's the day you're looking for. Uh, when the Lord says, enough's enough, I'm going to take my children on out of here. And then uh, he'll deal with the world like he used to in the Old Testament. Number seven. These people Jesus is referring to are obviously <coughs> religious and, are, uh, and, and recognize Jesus as Lord. Why should this come, not come as a shock to believer? Okay, I, that's poorly worded. These folks... <laughs> recognize Jesus as Lord. These false prophets he's talking about. Remember, we're talking about false prophets, false teachers. And when we project that in today, uh, uh, false denominations, these people call Jesus Lord. They believe in the virgin birth. They believe he's the son of God. They believe all these things, these, these essential doctrines. They don't believe them all, though. There's something deadly in what they believe. And, and you can't hardly distinguish them from a true believer. Somebody read, and, and so why should this not be a shock? Somebody read 2 Corinthians 11. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing of his, his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their work. All right, I want you all to think about what this passage of Scripture says right here. First of all, it says that Satan trans himself, 
It's transformed to an angel of light. That means you can't tell the difference, folks. <coughs> if Satan himself was in front of you, he's going to look like an angel of God, an angel of light. And that's why the devil sounds like the Lord. You can't tell the difference. When these folks that say the Lord's talking to me and the Lord said this, that, and the other, you can't distinguish sometimes what the devil between the devil and the Lord. They sound just alike. And 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 you can't you will be deceived if you don't know the word. And listen to this. This is verse 15 right there. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, that's his workers, that is his people that are here on the planet today. Remember, this is in Corinthians. This is talking straight to us in church age. If his ministers transform themselves into what? Ministers of righteousness. So these folks aren't out there converting people to demon uh, worship and devil worship. They're ministers of righteousness. They're feeding the poor. They're clothing the, the folks that are naked. They've got soup kitchens. They're doing all kinds of good. They're ministers of righteousness. It says it right there. Ministers of righteousness. And that's why I'm saying a lot of these folks do more good than we do. <laughs> but they're ministers of the devil. They have a false doctrine. They have heresy. And it's damnable. It'll put you in hell. It don't matter how many people you clothe and how many people you help, how much money you get. It all, it means nothing apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's why most folks call themselves Christians are going to end up in hell. Because they think they're going to go to heaven because they're a member of a church or they go to church every Sunday or they tithe or they do good works. They get over here in the Sermon on the Mount, what we've been reading, and they say, that applies to me. If I'll just do that, I'm in. And I'm going to tell you what, you can do all of that and he'll say, Lord, Lord, I never knew you. You got to put your faith and trust in His blood, and you, when you do that, you know what you start doing. All those things He's telling you to do. It's a result of that. But the folks that are doing the the works of righteousness apart from the shed blood of Jesus Christ, He never knew them. It says He never knew you. So they're ministers of righteousness. So that's why you can't judge a church or a pastor or a preacher or a Bible teacher or anything else based on what he's doing. You judge him based on what's coming out of his mouth. And does it line up with this book? And if it doesn't line up with this book, you run. You run. You know the biggest church in the world? I mean in the country. Isn't Joel Osteen's church the biggest church in the United States of America? You, th you ever hear him talk about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Blood atonement? You ever talk about sin? You ever talk about judgment? Have you ever heard him talk about hell? He ain't preaching this book. And, and he's just one of thousands and thousands and thousands. They may be doing great things for society and all of that stuff. And hey, I'm, I'm glad of it. But what's coming out of their mouth? Does it line up with this book? And if it doesn't, they're ministers of the devil. It says something right here. It says uh, in 22, he said, Have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name? So that doesn't make much sense. If you've got a, a minister of Satan, and he's cat, why would he be casting out demons? Wouldn't he want the demons to stay in folks? <clears throat> and so you might say, well, how could that be? If he has the ability to cast out a demon, he must be right with God. Who does more exorcisms than anybody in this country? Anybody? Sister? What church does more exorcisms? It's the Catholics. I've never seen it. So. This Catholic church is doing all these exorcisms. So where do we see a child of the devil casting out demons? Well, somebody read Matthew 10. In these 12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ sending the disciples out. All 12 of them. He said 12, right? So he sent these 12 disciples out, and they're doing all this stuff, and they're casting out demons. They're doing all this good. 
<coughs> they're healing folks. <coughs> they're casting out demons. They have miraculous powers. Somebody read John 6, 70. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. See, the Bible always interprets itself. It's always going to interpret itself. And it's never going to contradict itself. And it said right there, we cast out demons in your name. And he says, I never knew you. Well, you have an example right there of a, de of a demon-possessed Judas Iscariot. He says, one of you is a devil. And Judas is out there doing everything the other apostles are doing. He's casting out demons. He's healing folks. And he himself is possessed. And so it's possible. It's possible. Uh, what are some modern day examples of these folks? And we've 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 talked about that. There's lots of we could we could go down the list of of uh, all of the uh, the churches and denominations that do all kinds of good things uh, that preach a false gospel. Uh, you take your uh, mainline Protestant denominations that have abandoned the gospel for the social gospel. These people just think, well, just be a good person. Follow the golden rule. Remember when we, we covered the golden rule? How many people just say, well, they just live by the golden rule and you'll be all right. There's, there's all kinds of folks that fall into that category. Number 11 says, since God is all-knowing, what did he mean by I never knew you? He said right there, I never knew you. Now, does that mean that Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, didn't know him? No. God knows everything. He knows everything and everybody and everything that everybody's ever done, every, even what they think. He even knows what you would do given any set of circumstances. Not just you, but everybody that's ever existed. He knows everything. He's all-knowing. And yet he says, I did not know you. What's the context of that? Somebody every name is three. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. Thing you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I'll punish you for all your iniquities. So he's talking to Israel right now. He says, "You uh, only you have I known of all the families of the earth." What do we know about that word "know"? It said uh, Adam knew Eve. What is that? Come on, man. We're adults in this class. It's sexual intercourse. It is the merging together, flesh joining to flesh. I knew you. That's the intimate relationship. It's the same relationship the Lord Jesus Christ has with his church. It's the same relationship that God the Father has with Israel. He knows them at that intimate, connected level. And so what Jesus is saying is, he's not saying, I didn't ever know who you were. He said, I did not know you in that way. You are not a part of my flesh and my bones. Like he says of the church. Remember, in Ephesians 5, we talk about marriage. I speak of the church as great mystery. It's a great mystery. He didn't know them that way. All right. How do we know this passage is not directly applied to us as Christians? Somebody read 1 Timothy 1, 14. And the grace of our... Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for an everlasting life. For everlasting life. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ says? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so he's never going to say to you, if you put your faith in him, in his shed blood, for the forgiveness of your sins, he's never going to say to you, uh, I never knew you. Uh, you're a part of his flesh and his bones. You're a part of the body of Christ. He will not reject you. He cannot reject you. These folks think you can lose your salvation. You know, they'll go to that scripture and they say, no one can take uh, uh, you out of my father's hand. And, uh, and folks that believe you can lose your salvation will say, well, you can jump out of his hand. You're a part of his hand. He says, you are my flesh and my bones. You are a part of his hand. He'd have to cut his hand off 
to reject you. Yes, sister. Well, we're full of the Spirit. I don't know what that can be done to you. Say that again. When you walk in the Spirit, He cannot do that to you. Yes, absolutely. Because the Word is through the Holy Spirit. He speaks to you and you walk, uh, through the Word and gets you out of trouble and all kinds of things in your whole life. Absolutely, you know, you uh, trust him. You 1 trust Corinthians him. 10, 13 gives us that promise, and that's the thing you need to memorize if you don't. No temptation to you has taken you as common to man, but God is faithful with just. Every temptation will make a way of escape. So the way of escape's there, but that's how you you find that way. you got to be walking in the Spirit, walking in the light. Uh, you got to be in fellowship with God. And it's hard then. I'm going to tell you what, it can be very difficult. And so uh, that's a good word. 